Well, y'all go ahead and keep your Bibles out. We'll get back to it in just a second. Um, I don't know if y'all noticed last month, but, um, you know, being a recent transplant to the country, there are still certain things that, you know, sometimes just catch my attention. And I guess a few weeks ago, say last month, but it hadn't been that long, I started seeing all these hay trailers loaded down out here on the roads. And then we're out driving around and fields that were once, you know, high with grass were mown. Grass was out there drying. And then I come back a few days later and there are round bales piled up in the corner of people's fields. And I don't know how it works. I've done some research. But you can imagine how someone uninitiated into the, the, uh, the ins and outs of making hay just finds this thing to be totally fascinating. Mainly because it's like one day farmers and ranchers wake up and they've all gotten on the same page and they agree that it's time to make hay. It's like there's a secret government agency that's total purpose is to alert farmers, hey, better go out there and cut your hay. Or there's an app that I just don't have on my phone, but one morning it dings and they're like, hey, it's time to make hay. But that's not the way it works, is it? Now, I mean, y'all have been around it maybe enough to understand that there's more to it than that. That farmers and ranchers uh, are kind of on their own. And the good thing is they have a lifetime of experience in making hay. They've watched grandfathers, fathers, uncles go through the process of determining whether the hay, the, the grass is mature enough, whether the weather is right, whether once it's cut, uh, whether it's dry enough to bale. Now, they have all these different intuitions that me being, you know, I, a city slicker or whatever, I don't have. This is a unique set of wisdom that they possess that's totally foreign and unknown to me. Without it, animals would go hungry. But because they have it, this ecosystem of agriculture works. You know, the reason I bring all this up is because um, we need a similar kind of wisdom when it comes to the Christian life. And not a government-mandated, hey guys, it's time to cut your hay. Uh, not a phone app. But we need something internal, developed day after day, year after year, of being in the thick of the Christian life. And that's what the Apostle Paul lays out for us in the passage we've just read. You might have noticed the words that keep, I guess, heaping up on each other. Wisdom, discernment, understanding. These are things that are practical. Uh, a way of looking at the world that sees things from God's perspective. And Paul would have us and the Ephesians as Christians to have this wisdom. The same kind of wisdom that farmers put to use when they make hay. He wants us to put to use when we make decisions about the kind of conduct that's going to help us live our lives worthy of the calling to which we've been called. And so for the past six weeks, we've been kind of tracing out this wisdom, how it develops in chapters 4 and 5 of Ephesians. Last week, we saw Paul's command to uh, come out of the dark and live in the light. And we looked at those improper moral behaviors and speech that's out of place for those who are called saints. And we kind of left it there. We left with the commitment, us raising our hands and saying, hey, I'm done with those patterns of sin in my life. Jesus died on the cross so that I would live to righteousness. I'm going to live in that. I'm going to pursue life in the light. And I hope you had some success with that this week, saying no to sinful behaviors. Today is part two to last week's sermon, though. It's enough to leave the, light, the dark behind, come out into the light. But now we need to learn how to assess the decisions we have to make. And this morning, I want you to see pretty, pretty clearly, pretty simply, that every Christian is called to live consciously and consistently in their identity in Christ and the power of the Spirit by doing what is pleasing to God. I wrote this, and I botched it. So let's, I'm going to read it again, okay? Every Christian is called, to, is called to... Every Christian is called to consciously and consistently live out their identity in Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit by doing what is pleasing to God. I'm, you know, the syntax on that's all out of whack, but I think you get the point. Consciously, consistently, live out our identity in Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit by doing what is pleasing to God. It's really that simple. You know, I wish Paul would give us an itemized list of all the things that are pleasing to God. We could just have it in our wallets. We get to a difficult decision, and we pull it out. We run our eye down that list, 
If it's pleasing to God, we do it. If it's not pleasing to God, we don't do it. But you know how so many unanticipated things come up in our lives, so many circumstances, and we're left to wonder, okay, in this situation, what would Jesus do? What is most pleasing to God? And if you want to be able to make those decisions and walk wisely in the light, you're going to have to develop the character of life in the light. That's what he talks about here in verses 8 through 10. If you want to look at that with me, he says, At one time you were darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Of this character of life in the light is probably the clearest example that Paul's given yet as he traces out what it means to live worthy of the calling to which we've been called. I mean, it's kind of hitting on the same emphasis that he made in chapter 2 about us being dead in our trespasses and sins, but being made alive together in Christ. So what he talked about at the end of chapter 4 when he said we've put off the old self corrupted by deceitful desires and put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. But here it's clear. You were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. And this in the Lord language is something that should be familiar to you. Something we've seen throughout Ephesians, beginning in the first chapter. I mean, let me remind you that it is the language of our identification with and union with Christ. I mean, Paul said in chapter 1 that God the Father blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. And in, chap- and in verse 4 of chapter 1, he said he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. He said that we've obtained an inheritance in Christ. And we were sealed in Christ by the Holy Spirit. Who I love this. This is at the end of chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. The Holy Spirit's the guarantee of our inheritance until we obtain possession of it. More than that, in chapter 2, he says that the Gentiles, who were once far away from God, alienated from the life of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, have now been brought near to God in Christ by His blood. And together with the Gentiles, they are being built up into a spiritual house where God's presence can dwell in Christ. So you take all of that, all that language of blessing in Christ, identification with Christ, union with Christ, and you just add to the list that apart from Christ, you and I were darkness. But in Christ, we're light. That is an objective change. That is a real thing that has happened. And the reason this is so significant is because last week, when we were looking at what it means to live in the dark, um, we saw those improper moral behaviors, sexual immorality, all impurity, and greed. And we saw the speech that's out of place, right? crude jesting, foolish talk, impurity, filthy speech. And we saw that those things are a product of something deeper. The people who live in the world, who are living in the dark, are blinded by the God of this age, as Peter says. They are under the sway of the prince of the power of the air. Paul said in Ephesians 2.18, they're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them due to their hardness of heart. And so what do you expect from a person who has that internal spiritual condition. And Jesus, like we said last week, says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know, the old proverb, what's down in the well comes up in the bucket. We live a life consistent with who we are on the inside, and so a person in the dark who lives that way is just manifesting on the outside what they are on the inside. So the good thing about that is that Paul says... You were once like that. You were darkness. And the course of your life was just one sin after the next. But you who were darkness are now light in the Lord. Your internal condition has changed. And so the point about this whole passage is that I've thought about it from a bird's eye view. That verses 8 and 10 are almost like a 30,000 foot perspective on the Christian life. The character that God is working in us in remaking us from the person who was dead in their trespasses and sins to alive in Christ, in the dark, now light in the Lord, is the starting point. When that internal character changes, the external conduct flows naturally. But I've thought about it. Like, 
last week we talked about those improper moral behaviors and speech that was out of place. And you know, it would be entirely possible for a non-believer to live a life free from sexual immorality. It'd be possible for a non-believer to be generous and not greedy, to exhibit that kind of conduct in their life. But it wouldn't be evidence that the inside had changed. It'd just be that they'd somehow managed to control their behavior. And what I want to tell you this morning is that there's more to the Christian life than learning how to cope with patterns of sin, how to change your behavior. That what Paul says is that who you once were has ceased to be. You were once darkness. You're now light in the Lord. And because of that, this internal character can cause the conduct of your life to change. And he says this conduct is, is obvious, right? He talks about these three qualities, goodness, righteousness, and truth. He says this is the fruit of the light. And when you think about these words, I mean, they are pretty standard, all that is good, right, and true. Those are pretty standard religious concepts, uh, not unique to Christianity. Uh, and even throughout Scripture, we see them used to describe people, and especially God. I mean, for example, the psalmist says in Psalm 100, The Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and His faithfulness to all generations. That is who God is. But now Paul says that when we walk as children of the light, the fruit of the light that God has made us in Christ will be evident in our life. So in the same way that God is good, and in that goodness wants to bless us and enrich us, the word means to um, have a generosity towards others. The same way that God expresses that goodness to us, the Lord is good, we start to express that goodness to others. Instead of being greedy, like the person who's in the dark, trying to get more and more and more for ourselves, we find joy in making sure that others have what they need, and that their life is blessed and enriched because of the things we're able to give. Paul says that it consists in righteousness, or doing what is right from God's perspective, and in all that is true. You know, and, and this truth is, is key, because Paul talks about how the person who's in the dark is deceived. Right? They are following the course of this world, the prince of the power of air, the spirit that's now at work in them. They're not completely in control of their actions, and so they're living what they think is going to bring them joy and happiness, but in fact brings them death. But a person who's been set free, who's now light in the Lord, is able to live true. It's like what the psalmist prayed in Psalm 86.11. We just read it. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Jesus prayed in John 17. Confirm them, establish them in the truth, and your word is truth. See, the Christian's life is not built on promises, the assurances we make that, hey, God doesn't really care how we live our lives. He knows that we're not perfect. But it's built on what God has said in his word, on the truth. The Bible speaks about a person living that way as living uprightly, not hypocritically, putting on a false front or a false face. And so goodness, righteousness, and truth taken together are a clear departure of the life that you and I used to live, aren't they? And we weren't good people. Jesus said, who do you call good? There's only one who is good. Right? And when we look at ourselves, we're like the Apostle Paul in Romans 7. He says, I know that nothing good in me dwells. And then we come to a passage like this, which says that, hold up. You were once darkness, you're now light in the Lord. And when you walk out that identity, when you live in that identity, your life will consist in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Instead of being greedy to practice every kind of impurity or being ruled by the passions of your flesh, you're going to want to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. That's a total reorientation of the way we live our lives. And it's honestly, this is good news. Have y'all ever had a uh, New Year's resolution that you failed to achieve? <laughs> right. I mean, come on. I see about it. You know, you, you start on New Year's Day, and you're like, hey, this year is the year. I finally lose the weight. I've been saying I'm going to lose. And you get to th talking. I get to talk with my mom, and she starts telling me what she's going to cook on New Year's Day for lunch. And I'm like, I'm going to start tomorrow. <laughs> you know, and, and that's the idea. It's like, how can a guy who can't say no to seconds at New Year's lunch, 
no to sweets, somehow say no to sin. I can't. I am just as caught up in my desire for extra black-eyed peas and collard greens as I am in my desire for those things that dishonor God. But what Paul says is that in Christ, we have undergone a radical personal reorientation. We were once darkness, but we're now light in the Lord. And so the life we're talking about, the life in the light, really consists in first and foremost experiencing that change of our character, who we are inside, so that who we are outside flows naturally from what God has done. And when it does, we'll see this conduct of life in the light. Um, Paul talks about this in verses 11 through 18, and y'all know I was supposed to preach through verse 14 last week and couldn't. And so I haven't really left myself enough time because I'm ready to start on the book of Daniel on the first Sunday in October. And so we got three weeks left in Ephesians. And so what we're going to do is, uh, instead of going real detailed through these next little, this next little bit, these next eight verses, I want to kind of give you the outline and how they all fit together in the argument Paul's making. Because some people see verses, um, I guess, what, 4 through 14, or 1 through 14, as one section, and then 5 through 21 as another section. And so all the commentaries I use, they all split these up really clearly. And here I am, smashing them together. But it makes sense to me, because what Paul does in verses 11 through 14 is highlight four pairs of contrasting behaviors. And, and it's crazy how clearly they follow the consistent pattern. He says, don't do this, but do this. And so I think these four pairs are almost like the bumpers in a pinball machine. And what he's trying to do is sort of sketch out a skeleton for the life that pleases the Lord. And if we hold these four things in our mind, we're going to probably, in the course of our lives, bounce from one to the next but they offer to us the sort of parameters for a conduct that's pleasing to God. And so the first one in verse 11, Paul says to expose the unfruitful works of darkness. Uh, he says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. You see, a life in the light, the conduct of a life in the light, uh, is in, in, involves more than simply refraining from sinful patterns of behavior. You know, it, it's more than not participating in the unfruitful works of darkness, saying bye to improper moral behavior, controlling your tongue, not participating in the speech that's out of place. Instead, it's a sort of renewal to the other side, not just refraining, but adding on something. It says instead of participating in the unfruitful works of darkness, expose them. I mean, and, and the idea is that a person who's experienced this transformation all of a sudden, starts to shine light into the darkness where they once lived. It's what Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, You're the light of the world. A city on the hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. We know this is kind of in the background of Paul's mind because back in Ephesians 2, and maybe you memorized this, Ephesians 2.10, he says that we were created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We know, for instance, that this is God's end goal, that there are no such thing as incognito Christians, Christians that experience a personal inner transformation where they secretly love the Lord and are trying to live out their lives before Him. But if you knew Him, you worked with Him, you'd never know it. According to Paul, Jesus, when a person experiences true transformation, their life is going to show evidence of it. Just like a city on a hill cannot be hidden, and a person who lights a lamp in the center of their one-room house would never put a basket on top of it. They'd put it on a stand so it could shine light everywhere. According to Paul, when you go from darkness to light, the whole course of your life changes. So that instead of just refraining from the sin, you take on a new kind of behavior. That everywhere you go starts demonstrating to people, sometimes uncomfortably so, that you're living for Jesus. And they aren't. So that's the first thing. The conduct that's pleasing to God, life in the light, involves exposing the works of darkness. Second, he says in verse 15, Look carefully then how you walk. 
not as unwise, right, there's a negative, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. You know, last week we saw one of the defining characteristics of life in the dark was foolish talk, the talk of fools. And I told you last week that this talk is the talk that never gets down to what's most important, matters of faith, conversations that are supposed to build us up in our walk with Christ. But y'all know it's possible not just to have foolish talk, but to live foolishly too. It's possible to live in such a way that you fail to comprehend what God is really up to. And the Proverbs are probably the the best place to really understand what a foolish life is all about, a life that's unwise. The the Proverbs call the fool complacent, like the rancher who isn't paying attention to the weather and misses the window to cut hay. They're complacent, unaware of what's really going on around them. Proverbs 14, 16 says that one who is wise is cautious and turns away from evil, but a fool is reckless and careless. Proverbs 10.23 says, Doing wrong is like a joke to a fool, but wisdom is pleasure to a man of understanding. When Paul's talking about walking wisely, he has in mind that we would really keep our minds set on what God is up to in the world. That we wouldn't be complacent, we wouldn't be reckless, just doing whatever feels right in the moment. Not that we joke about doing wrong after the fact, But we consciously, consistently put forth the effort to think through the decisions we make so that we walk as a person who accurately decides based on what they know God is doing. Um, It's clear, you know, that this new character we're talking about takes root and changes the way we even assess decisions. I like the way the uh, one pastor put it. He said, this means withdrawing from the temptations of this world removing ourselves from its cares and delights and renouncing everything that would hinder our spiritual growth. Now, you think, think about that. Renouncing everything that would hinder our spiritual growth. And I, I see your faces. You're kind of all like looking down at the carpet. You're like trying not to make eye contact because that's a, that's a really hard challenge. Renounce everything that hinders spiritual growth. We know there are some things that probably take our attention away from the Lord. There are some ways we spend our time that we know are not the best. But in the end, we don't think they're going to have as big an effect on us as maybe God would have us think. I mean, after all, Paul says we're supposed to walk as wise and not as unwise because the days are evil. You know, I, I've tried to really force myself to keep these brief, but just to pause for a second. You know, some people think about this statement, the days are evil, make the best use of the time, the days are evil, in terms of personal productivity. You know, there's a huge industry. You, know, you go to any bookstore, go on Amazon, and you'll find a huge Im- industry on people who offer to us ways of being more productive. One book that's been influential in my life is the book, and I love this, Getting Things Done. And that's what we're all after, right? We want to make sure that we get our to-do list done every day so that, you know, we make hay while the sun shines. Um, we don't put off for tomorrow what can be done today. You know, we try to be productive. But Paul's encouragement here about making the best use of the time is not about productivity or procrastination. It's about a very real spiritual reality that the world is not our friend. It's just not. You know, the the people who are living their lives apart from God are not in the business of making sure you and I make it to heaven and stand before Jesus and give an account of our lives in such a way that he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. That doesn't factor into the way they plan their business year the way they decide on the programming they're going to put on TV, what advertisements they flash across our Facebook. You know, they do not care whether you're living your life for Jesus or not. Because of that, if we believe that, we'd be extra cautious in the way we spent our time. We'd think about things on a different level. Maybe we would say we'd be more wise in the decisions we make because we know that 
To be a friend with the world is to be at enmity with God. So Paul says, um, walk as wise, not as unwise, making the best use of the time. The third one really just follows along from that. He says, you need to understand what the will of the Lord is. That's verse 17. Don't be foolish. Understand what the will of the Lord is. In other words, the efforts we put forth to walk in the light will require dedicated reflection and consideration as we evaluate the ethical decisions we make. And, and this is probably, on the practical level, one of the places where you and I have probably been more times than we want to admit. We've wrestled with God. God, what is your will for me? Do you want me to take this job? Do you want me to move my family? Do I risk the virus and send my kids to school? You know, these are issues that we wish Paul would have written on that cheat sheet we keep in our wallet. But instead, he's trying to retune our hearts and minds so that we think clearly enough to make decisions that are pleasing and in line with the will of God. You know, these are questions that aren't easy to answer, are they? I mean, who really wants to have to decide whether they send their kid to school or not? That's not a decision anybody wants to make. It doesn't come with all the answers, you know. It's, you you got to figure it out. And what Paul says is when we're in those situations asking questions of what is right and wrong, our goal ought to be not what feels right or what's easiest, but what would God have me do in this situation? That's the key. That's what he means when he says, understand what the will of the Lord is. I like this two-word phrase one commentator, F.F. F. Bruce, says. He says, what we're looking for here is intelligent reflection. Intelligent reflection. To call into our minds who God is. is the one who's great. The one who's good. The one who promises to never leave us or forsake us. Who's given us his word to prepare us for all the things we're going to face in our lives. To call that into mind. To search his word. To intelligently reflect on that. And then act. Act. You know, and that's, I think, where we paralyze ourselves, isn't it? What's God's will? And we never get down to making the decision. But Paul would say, hey, just intelligently reflect on it and act. But this is the big one. Okay, the fourth pair. Verse 18. Do not get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. All right, so there you have your negative and your positive. Don't be drunk. Be filled with the Spirit. And as I read through this and as I prepare for this sermon, I'm a little caught off guard by verse 18, and maybe you are too. The first three are general and, specific, and, and, and nonspecific. Sorry, they're general and wisdom-oriented. Things like be wise not unwise. Understand what the will of the Lord is. And then we come to verse 18, and its specificity sort of sneaks up on us. And it's kind of as uncomfortable for some people as last week's sermon on sexual immorality. And, um, you know, I probably owe you at some point a sermon on the Bible's view of alcohol. And we could work through that together. But this morning, let me just give you three points on it, okay? Right from this text. Number one, the New Testament consistently describes drunkenness as a sin that falls short of Christian conduct. And I'll give you a few verses. You can search this out. 1 Corinthians 11, 21, 1 Thessalonians 5, 7, 1 Timothy 3, 8, and Titus 2, 3. All right, so consistently, the New Testament describes drunkenness as a sin that fails to live up to the calling to which we've been called. Two, drunken parties were a fact of life in the ancient world, and even had religious connotations. And the Greeks and Romans had a god who was devoted to vineyards and fertility. His name was, in, in Rome, they called him Bacchus. In Greece, they called him Dionysius. And as they gathered to offer up sacrifices to the gods, they, the best thing they could do for Bacchus was to get drunk and sing his praises. And so that's what they did. And uh, many commentators believe that in the back of Paul's prohibition here against drunkenness is this transition from pagan worship to Christian worship. Three, as former pagans living in a, a pagan society, prone to these drunken, riotous parties, characterized, Paul says, by dissolution or debauchery, um, some Christians struggled to let go of that. 
And so you can read, for example, in 1 Corinthians 11, how the Corinthians had taken that ancient practice of getting drunk and partying to their God and brought that into their celebration of the Lord's Supper. And so Paul, I mean, they bring down, you know, harsh apostolic condemnation, saying, I don't know what you guys are doing when you gather, but you're not eating and drinking the Lord's Supper. So those are some of the facts about the New Testament's approach to drunkenness. Paul is describing a way of life that's distinct from the surrounding world, and it's clear that drunkenness is one of those behaviors that characterizes life in the dark and has to be left behind. But hear me on this. I actually don't think the drunkenness is Paul's main point in verse 18. I think what he wants us to see is what comes next. Be filled with the Spirit. So I want you to hear me. Drunkenness fails to live up to the standard that we've been called to as Christians. And prohibitions against it are always appropriate. right? So Paul's not just saying this to say it. But what he's trying to do is draw it into our minds in order to contrast it between the positive thing he really wants us to pursue, which is being filled with the Spirit. I mean, the danger of drunkenness is that a drunk person loses all their inhibitions, their decision-making. And eventually, like, if they drink long enough, they lose their consciousness, which is crazy. And so the New Testament emphasizes sobriety, clear-headedness, thinking clearly. Then we come to this idea of being filled with the Spirit. And if a person who's under the influence of alcohol experiences such a haze in their brain that they're unable to be rational in their decision-making, what Paul wants us to do is be under the influence of the Holy Spirit so that he's the one exerting control over our decisions. Um, this is what the New Testament talks about. For example, in the first time we see the Holy Spirit arrive on the scene in the church is Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. The disciples are in this upper room, and they're praying for the gift that Jesus promised them the Father was going to send them, the Holy Spirit. And as they're praying, they hear the sound of a mighty rushing wind. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes on them. Flames are on top of their heads, looking like tongues. And they go out into the street and start talking in other languages. Jerusalem's filled with people who are there to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. And so they all come running out to hear what this, what they think is debaucherous, riotous behavior is all about. I think it's a drunken mob out there shouting in the streets. Some people even say, Acts 2.15, that these folks are just drunk with new wine. What does Peter have to say? When he stands up to speak, he says, Brothers, listen to me. These people aren't drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. How could they be drunk already? So the idea is that the Holy Spirit had come on them in such a way that He was directing the decisions they made. And for the outsiders, only thing they could think of was these people are drunk. But when Paul's talking about it, he wants us to actively pursue the infilling of the Spirit so that in the same way a drunk person experiences uh, total control of their alcohol, the Spirit would control our lives. We experience, this is it, spirit-induced conformity to Christ. And what this looks like isn't hard for us to imagine. Paul actually identifies it with five participles. I, you see this, right? Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Giving thanks to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And submitting to one another in reverence to Christ. See, when a person becomes intoxicated under the influence of the Holy Spirit. They don't end up being debaucherous. Um, they don't experience dissolution, which is like wasting all their money on more and more and more. Instead, they start to do good to the people around them. And I think it's amazing. It's, it's totally unsurprising, given what we've already seen in Ephesians, that a Spirit-filled life is directed towards others more than it is ourselves. Spirit doesn't come to us just to make our lives better, but to bless the people around us. He says we're going to speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. These three words are, it's hard to decide whether they are just like synonymous completely or if they're trying to draw our minds to three different types of songs. Psalms are literally psalms from the Old Testament. And to play a psalm meant to strum on a harp. Um, hymns, or the word is actually odes, were songs that praised divinity, 
in the ancient world, and, and they were sung in pagan temples. But they weren't sung with music. They were sung a cappella, and often solo, like chanted of praise to God. Spiritual songs, I think, are songs that are inspired by the Spirit, or what the book of Revelation calls a new song, something that the Spirit lays on your heart, and you just kind of offer it up in praise to God. But the crazy thing about this speaking of these psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs is that it's not just singing to God. Right? Paul says that we're going to sing and make melody in our hearts to, to the Lord. So that's true. That happens. It's to God. But it's really to each other. That when we're filled with the Spirit, when, when we show up at church, the Spirit inspires not drinking songs, not songs that celebrate the praise of Bacchus and the way we feel when we are inebriated, but the things we think about when we think about the greatness of God. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. That's what we do when we gather together. And we remind each other. Hearing your voices today, I, I just kind of stopped singing up here and just trying to listen. And it is an encouragement to hear other Christians sing. And, and I know some of your life circumstances, some of the things you guys are facing right now. Some of y'all are kind of going through difficult seasons of life. And to know that you're back there behind me somewhere, your voice mingling in with all the other voices in the room, singing about, you know, our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's coming with power. He's fighting our battles. I know you're in battles. And that means something to you. And to hear you proclaim the excellency of God, that he's on your side, is an encouragement to me. And that's what the Spirit is all about. He's inspiring us to encourage each other. Of course, he says we're going to sing and make melodies in our hearts of the Lord. That means that the words don't just pass over our lips as meaningless phrases, but that actually we're in tune with what the words say. Of course, he says we're going to give thanks. The Spirit inspires us to gratitude towards God. And finally, he says we're going to submit to one another in reverence to Christ. And that's the kicker, isn't it? To come to church, to be conformed to the image of Christ, to take on the character that he would have us take on, to live out a life that's not aimed fundamentally at pursuing what's good for me, what makes me happy, but submitting to you, to put your needs above my own. That's what the Spirit inspires. And so walking wisely in the light means that we consciously and consistently live out our identity in Jesus, who willingly laid his life down for us. And in the power of the Spirit, we intelligently reflect on what would be pleasing to God and then act. You know, I think the six weeks we've spent uh, through chapters four and five have kind of maybe in a way been repetitive, but they've been good for me personally, and I, I hope they have been for you, because we know that living to the standard to which we've been called is a challenge. You know, maintaining unity in the body is difficult, especially in a political and social season like we're living in. It's difficult sometimes to view people in our church as our real tribe, the real people we identify with. It's even more difficult to promote unity because most Christians are non-confrontational. They just want to avoid the conflict. And sometimes uniting people requires that you confront division. We know that living up to our calling means pursuing personal holiness. And that's a challenge, too. And most of us just want to believe that God is one day going to zap us and make us totally different. But if we've seen anything, and, and we're going to see next week when we talk about submission in the household, and the next week when we talk about in the, in the relationship between parents and children, and that it's difficult to pursue and live this out. So I want to encourage you. If tomorrow I came into possession of a hayfield, the most beautiful coastal Bermuda you've ever seen, I would do what I bring to all sorts of things. I would try to learn as much about it as I can. I'd go on YouTube and I'd watch some videos about making hay, call the extension service, ask questions, write down notes. I might even look into Texas A&M online classes, try to understand what it means to manage a hayfield. And at the end of the day, I'd feel a little more confident in my knowledge 
that I know what I'm doing here in making this A. But I wouldn't really know how to make hay until I had done it day in, day out, year after year, and had developed a knowledge of how this particular field differs from all the other ones and what's best as the lay of the land is and what's best in our little microclimate. I wouldn't know that until I had personal experience. And so what I want to do is encourage you that after six weeks of perhaps beating you over the head over the kind of life that God's called you to live, you're on the right track. That what's happened in you has already happened in you. In Christ, the old person who is deceived by deceitful desires has been put off. Your mind is renewed. That hitch in your giddy-up, the pause you make before you do what's wrong, is evidence that you're not in the dark, that you're not totally closed off to what God's up to in the world, that what you need to do is to consistently and consciously exercise the choosing faculties that God has given you, to consistently say no to life in the dark, and to say yes to life in the light. And as you live out this identity in Christ, what you'll find is the Holy Spirit that God has graciously given to each of us is going to more and more empower you so that the things that once held sway over you, which felt like you were chained up to them, don't have the same pull anymore. And by that conscious, intelligent reflection, diligent, persistent action, you will become the person God's created you to be, and you will live your life in the light. So keep up the good work, church. I love you. I can't believe, can't imagine what God's going to do with us. It's going to be good. Will y'all pray with me?